you. Uh, the first thing I have to say, of course, is uh, many thanks to everyone who has contributed. You've got a, a, a brilliant team here, and uh, I despise organizing such events like this. If I never organize again, I'll be quite happy about it. And uh, I know what's involved in the back end of setting up something like this. And uh, thank you very much to all of you who are responsible for this and those who are coming as well. And I really have enjoyed uh, the speakers uh, previous to me and, um, and uh, Judith uh, in particular, uh, very fascinating information, which, uh, much of which I was completely oblivious to. And in, in homage to, to Lee Harvey Oswald and to Judith, um, I carry this uh, in my wallet. It's a little bit stained, unfortunately, from the black ink on my wallet. But this is a, uh, a $5 bill, and it happens to also be the answer, quite frankly, in terms of us affecting a better world to a great degree. This is a, a 1963 issued $5 bill, which was a direct result of John F. Kennedy issuing an executive order which effectively bypassed the private Federal Reserve Bank, which effectively owns America. And this is a United States note. If you look at a dollar, you will see that it says Federal Reserve Note. And if you look at this one, it says United States note. And the difference couldn't be any more extreme, whereas one is a private bank that charges us all interest for every single dollar that comes into print, which means you will never repay the debt. It is not possible to repay the debt because the debt is greater than the actual money in circulation. Isn't that a great system? Boy, oh boy, I'd like to be a shareholder in the private Federal Reserve Bank. And John F. Kennedy he was doing many dangerous things, <laughs> many dangerous things. Um, he was also insisting that the nuclear power plant, Demona, in Israel was going to be, would need to be inspected. We hear so much about the nuclear ins uh, installations in Iran being inspected. Why in the hell is Israel allowed to produce hundreds of nuclear weapons and not only produce those weapons while committing an active campaign of genocide, but also to threaten the world, literally, Many high-level thinkers in Israel have talk, talked about the so-called Samson option. And maybe I'll get back to that later, but if you've not heard of the Sa by a, by a, a hand-raising, who is aware of the Samson option? There you go. That's something you should look up, and I'm not going to do the favor of telling you what it is right now. Maybe I'll get onto it later, but the bottom line is John F. Kennedy was the only U.S. president in recent history, in the last hundred years, who had any integrity. And actually, he was a hero, and he clearly was defying the orders of the masters of the universe, or the masters of the planet. And this was the way that he was directly challenging them. Now, I'm going to hand this to somebody. Let me, I want it back, but I've handed this before, because you should touch this, and you should really understand the value of this because it is the single most important thing that we can do. And to see that you have Danish kroner, this is, you know, it's not everything in terms of your nation, but that is huge, the fact that you don't have the euro. So if you will, please, just hand that around and make sure I get it back. So, uh, it's really beautiful to be able to get up and talk, you know, freely. Uh, I never script anything, but you know it has been said that I would talk about my journey. So I'm going to talk about that for a while. I think we're going to take a little break in about 50 minutes, and uh, for five minutes or so, and then we'll come back and maybe I'll start talking about the bigger, broader picture. I've led a very incredible, blessed life. You know, I, I was raised in Southern California. Uh, in my younger years, uh, my, my passions were football, and I mean football, as in football as the whole world recognizes it, football, not American football, not fucking soccer, I'm talking about football. I loved football, I was very good at it, and I enjoyed it, but I gave that up for surfing because I love surfing even more, and I love the sea. Uh, and that was always, you know, I would not let my mom rest unless she took me to the beach on weekends, and that was, that was it. I was in charge, basically. And, and I went to the, to the ocean every weekend, and eventually, you know, I surfed. And, and uh, you know, I grew up in a charmed life. You know, my mom and dad divorced when I was about five years old, however. My mom raised me as a single mom, only child. 
And, you know, as mothers do, they generally spoil their only child. And if there's not a father around to kind of even things out a bit, you know, a guy like me becomes, to be honest, a spoiled brat. Um, and, you know, I think that's a fair assessment of who I was. Not my fault, really. I mean, you know, it wasn't my decision to, to, to have no father around. But the bottom line was, uh, you know, I did anything and everything I wanted. I, I really am Jesus, man. The things that I did when I was young, my God. Um, and I got in trouble in school regularly. I remember getting into fights uh, regularly, not because I liked fighting per se, but I did not like bullies, and I did not like people who try to intimidate you or try and uh, you know, coerce you into whatever. I never liked that. I never got into a fight where I threw the first punch. I always needed someone to hit me first. And after that, fine, no problem, let's go. Uh, and every time I got the better of somebody, which was usually most of the time, I would stop. You know, I, I'm not a madman. I, I don't enjoy violence. I'm just not willing to back down. And, you know, this is, this is the way I, it's always been in me. Um, I've always been a bit cantankerous. And, uh, and in school, I recognized very early, this is bullshit. This is just bullshit. And because my father wasn't around, if my father had been around, he would have insisted that I get straight A's and, you know, I would have been punished, I'm sure, quite severely if I had laxed off and not done what I was capable of doing. But because my mom was raising me, uh, you know, whatever, you know, I ditched school a lot, I got referred and suspended and all sorts of stuff, got into fights, and I barely graduated high school, barely, barely. In fact, I wasn't allowed to go to the prom. It was a choice between graduation or the prom. And I, I chose, you know, graduation. It meant something to my mom and, you know, family. So I did the graduation ceremony. I uh, had jobs when I was younger, as you do. You want to make money. So uh, every job I ever had, it didn't last long because as soon as I felt I was being disrespected, I was out of there. And then I got this job as a, as a busboy, uh, assistant waiter, they called him, in a French restaurant in San Diego. El Biscocho, it was called. And that was the first job I had where the boss, the maitre d', he was awesome. I, I love and respect this man to this very day. He really had an impression on me because this man was the epitome of consistency. You know, whatever he asked of you, he was doing himself to a T. And the expectation was that we are going to provide the very best service. We are going to meet that commitment to our customer, and if ever we fail, we will make it up in every way that we can. And in French service, you know, it, it, this many courses, there's a lot to it. That job was, was very challenging. A lot of ways to screw up service when you've got several courses. And while all this stuff may seem really quite silly, I loved it. I thought it was great. I loved that job. And I worked there for a year and a half. But while I was there, about a year into it, I remember I was watching a movie, which I'll bet many of you have seen. And it was during that movie that I decided I would join the Marine Corps because I realized I was getting a little too comfortable. And this is the white privilege that many of us understand, or at least I acknowledge it. You know, as a white middle-class kid, you know, reasonably looking, uh, good looking, you know, uh, articulate, you know, fairly clever, coming from a middle-class uh, family, there's a lot of opportunities for you, <laughs> really, you know, that aren't available to a lot of other people who happen to have darker skin or come from less privileged backgrounds. This is the reality. And I felt like, just intuitively, I knew, like, I'm too comfortable. The job I had was great. I was making excellent money. I loved the job. I had a really nice car. I lived literally on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean with floor-to-ceiling windows looking at the Pacific Ocean. I had a, a keg machine, you know, where you have a keg and a fridge and a tap. I had that fucking brilliant, man. And really everything, you know, pool right outside my door. You know, it was fantastic. I was making good money, really loved it. But again, I felt I was getting a little too comfortable. It was all too easy. And many people who worked in this place had worked there for many years. You know, they'd started off young and they were there 15, 20 years later. I didn't want to be a waiter or a captain or even a maitre d'. You know, I knew that wasn't enough for me. So while I was watching this movie, anybody want to take a guess what movie it was? <laughs> Who's that? Yeah, Full Metal Jacket. Who, who here has seen that movie? 
fucking brilliant movie, man. That movie is, is, it could be a documentary. In fact, uh, the, the, the guy who plays the, the, the drill instructor is a former drill instructor from Vietnam era. That guy was doing exactly what he would have been doing in Vietnam. It was, his, it, that movie is incredible. And while I was watching the movie, you may say, man, he's really fucking sick and twisted. Why would you want to join the Marine Corps after watching that movie? But the thing was, is that I really admired the strength, you know, the strength and the, the, the kind of discipline that is required. If you remember the movie, uh, the first half of it is boot camp at Paris Island. I went to uh, MCRD, uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, San Diego, which funny enough was my hometown. So while I was in boot camp, I could see where my mom worked in the building in downtown, and I could see places that I had visited. And yet, when you're in boot camp, it's three months long, you have no contact with anyone outside at all. So I could see it, but it was as far away as, you know, as the moon, quite frankly. And I joined the Marine Corps because I felt I was lacking in discipline and initiative, and I felt the Marine Corps would give it to me, but I didn't actually realize at the time what I know now. And the reason why I joined the Marine Corps was to get the father that I never had. And I knew intuitively that, you know, I, I didn't have a man as a role model. I didn't you know how to act like a man. How could I? So the Marine Corps will give that to me. Again, I didn't know that at the time. I thought it was just all about discipline and initiative. I knew I had high goals. I wanted to make money like everybody else. I, I intended to make lots of money, so I knew I needed to work hard. And just to give you an insight to my character, I mean, this was inbuilt in me, probably largely because of my mom, a beautiful woman. Anything good I've ever done in my life, I have to directly attribute to her. What a beautiful woman. I mean, really, loved me to a fault, and I can certainly forgive her for that. Um, she passed on a couple years ago, but an absolutely beautiful woman. And so I joined the Marine Corps, and I wasn't like a super patriot. You know, I just, again, I felt I would get something positive. I wanted to make a lot of money. And before I joined the Marine Corps, I remember taking this uh, self-help course by a guy named Charles Givens. He was a real estate guru of the time. And uh, wanting to learn how to make money, I thought, well, learn from somebody who's actually made it in the field that you would like to make the money. So one of the exercises this guy had in his program was to identify your list of priorities as a person. Immediately, I knew what my answer was. Immediately. Peace of mind. Because I knew that I was not willing to make money at the expense of lying, of harming, of screwing other people over. I want to make money, and I want to do it in an ethical way. I don't want to make money in a way that I'm going to feel bad about. I'm not going to do that. So, you know, I'm not willing to, to make that sacrifice, as uh, Mark uh, Devlin was referring to late, earlier, you know, selling your soul to the devil. And that is literally true. I'm, I'm quite convinced of that. I wasn't willing to do that. And so I joined the Marine Corps, and... Again, I wasn't a super patriot or anything. I love my country, you know, I thought it was the greatest in the world. You know, the indoctrination is very powerful, very, very powerful. I mean, you know, most of us, I don't think, are as aware of the power of it as we should be, quite frankly. And, you know, I wasn't. I didn't. I thought I was a thinking person. I didn't think I was some idiot regurgitating a bunch of trivial pursuit fucking questions on command, and that's literally what I was doing. So. I joined the Marine Corps, and if you've ever, who here is American or spent time in America? Is there any Americans here? I know there was one earlier, so there's, well, there's one. Okay, yeah, there we go. Um, you, you know the Marine Corps commercials? No? Oh, good, you don't watch TV. That's why you're here, actually, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the Marine Corps commercials, they usually have them on the football games and stuff like that, you know. And uh, they're awesome. They're the best. Uh, you know, going back to the 80s and 90s, they're, they're really good, man. They show the, the Marines in their dress blue uniforms, which are like the best looking uniforms. And they do their drills, and they're just precision. They're just perfect, man, in every way. They represent the top level of what it is to be an American standing up for what's right. The marketing, the packaging, the presentation is first class. 
And I knew that's what I wanted. If I was going to join the military, I wasn't going to join the Air Force and go, you know, fucking pay, do paperwork. I wanted the Marine Corps and I wanted the infantry. You know, you, when you're in the Marine Corps, when they punish you, they send you to the infantry. And that's what I wanted. And so here I am. I, be careful what you wish for. I got it. I was in the Marine Corps infantry. And amongst the principles that are really espoused is honor, integrity. The mission is more important than the self. That's an important one, boy. That's, that's what, that quality right there, boy. <laughs> when, when there's something bigger than you and you're willing to die for that thing that's bigger than you and you're serious about that, boy, you can't control someone like that, really. And leadership by example. So instead of saying, charge, you know, it's charge and you're the one in the front. You know, you're leading. You're going to be the one that's going to take it. That takes balls and integrity and strength. It's the warrior spirit. It's something the Scandinavians, the Nordics, you know, you know. That's a man, you know, and I thought that's what I wanted. I wanted to be a man. And so I believed all that stuff. And while we were on a ship in the Mediterranean, we uh, were traveling into the hot Mediterranean in the summer, and the, the ships are not comfortable. I mean, you know, they're, <laughs> they're not made for comfort, for Christ's sake. So we, we're on this ship. It's very, very hot. And we have to travel through various areas to go, you know, to the chow hall where we eat and to the flight deck where we can get some fresh air and stuff like this. And our staff NCOs, staff NCOs are like the heart and soul of the Marine Corps. You have your officers who are oftentimes just these university degree brats who are just going through the motions for their political careers. And, you know, you get a, the lowest ranking officer is higher in rank than the highest rank enlisted guy, who's the working guy. So these are the staff NCOs. These are the working guys. These are the guys who've been in the Marine Corps for 10, 15, 20 plus years. They are the badass guys. They're the drill instructor that you see in full metal jacket. That's a staff NCO. And while we were on the ship, they handed down a policy which was <laughs> Uh, nobody's allowed to come through our birthing area where we live anymore. Nobody's allowed to come through that birthing area anymore. And the reason why they didn't want us going through that birthing area is because every time you open the hatch to go in and, and the hatch to get out, what little air conditioning was there would escape. So it would become warmer and less comfortable. The problem with that policy is that it forced us lower ranking slaves to basically go three times as far to the chow hall and to the flight deck and other areas. And the problem with that is that we were going through working areas where the Navy, we're on a ship, it's their ship, we, you know, we're, we get delivered and you know, they're constantly working. We're going through working areas. So there is a safety issue of us having to go through these working areas, especially when the reason is to keep the fucking staff NCOs cooler in their goddamn fucking birthing area which is an embarrassment. It's not leading by example at all. Not only that, they had no right to do this. They had no right to close off a passageway. It's not their fucking right. It's the captain and the highest enlisted Navy personnel, the chief. They're the only ones that can... So they're breaking rules and they're compromising their integrity and they're being hypocrites. So I made a decision. And the decision was, I'm going to you know, report this to the chief, the Navy chief. Now, if you know anything about the military, especially the infantry, this is a mortal sin that I committed. I jumped my chain of command. I completely bypassed, because technically what I was supposed to do was go to my chain of command and say, hey, listen, you know, this isn't right. <laughs> and if I did that, if I went to the staff and said, listen, you know, I really don't think, oh, fuck off, you know, go away. It would have been laughed at. It would have been done, a joke. They wouldn't have listened to me, so I didn't waste my time with that. I jumped my chain of command and I went to the chief. And I told him, and he immediately sorted that out. And so the staff NCOs are like, what the fuck is going on here? Who did this? And they sent down word to uh, the squad leaders who came down to the squads 
And I remember my squad leader coming, Staff Sergeant, or Sergeant Mays, and he came and he, he, he didn't expect any of us to say yes. And um, he said, you know, <laughs> fucking the staff NCOs are pissed. Who, does anyone know who did this? And for me, it was a very simple matter. This is a matter of honor and integrity, everything the Marine Corps says it's about. I could do this secretly. I was under no obligation to say who it was. I could have done it in writing. I could have handed it in a way that no one could have traced it back to me. But that wasn't the honorable thing to do, or at least I didn't think so. So I answered the question. Now, that moment in my life is the most profound moment, hands down. Nothing has affected my life more than the decision to say, I'm the one that did it. And I remember the look on Sergeant Mays' face when, when I said that, and he just looked at me like, oh, fuck. Right, okay, Nichols. I changed my name later. I was Nichols at the time, but I changed it. I'll spare you the reasons why. It has nothing to do with any kind of avoiding anything or anything like that, more about Irish pride than anything else. And um, so <laughs> eventually he went back. He told, he told uh, my platoon sergeant, who would have been the equivalent of the drill instructor in full metal jacket, 17 years Marine, and... Uh, he, he said, bring him here. And Sergeant Mays came and got me, and he took me to some back little corner in the ship. You know, I had never seen before. You know, somewhere like over here, maybe, like this sort of kind of nowhere where, you, you know, you <laughs> I just knew like, Jesus, man, I'm in big shit. <laughs> and he, he looked at me, and he said, Nichols, in my 17 years in the Marine Corps, you're the biggest piece of shit I've ever known, and I'm going to fry your ass first chance I get. And I tell you, why are you clapping at that? <laughs> so, going back to Full Metal Jacket, remember how Private Pile, you remember Private Pile, Everybody's seen the movie. Everybody remembers Private Pile, right? Private Pile is just fat. He's slow. He can't keep up. He's, he's a problem. He's, he's, and, and, and in truth, in fairness to the training in the military, yeah, you, that guy can really be harmful to the unit. You know, you need everyone to be strong, to be fast, to be ready. Mentally and physically strong. You know, this person will endanger the others. It's, and it may sound harsh, and it is, but it's true. And so he's punishing Private Pile over and over, and it's just not fucking working. So what tactic does he use but an incredibly useful tactic, I can tell you. Instead of punishing Private Pile, he then starts to punish the entire platoon. The thing is, he makes it very clear that the reason why the entire platoon is being punished is because of Private Pile, which means the pressure on Private Pile is going to step up big fucking time. And that's when they have in the movie what's called a blanket party, where they wake up in the middle of the night, they take the blanket, they wrap it down over the bunk, and then they put their soap in the blanket and they just start whacking him. Uh, he, Private Pyle's already challenged, but now he's traumatized and he's got no friends, uh, but one guy who's trying to best, his best to help him. I went through something similar. I learned that in my platoon, I had maybe two friends out of 35, 40 Marines, two. And <laughs> every moment from that point forward, I was constantly looking over my shoulder. And keep in mind, we were at sea. We were at sea, man. And I'll tell you what, people can go overboard. And there were some angry Marines who did not like me at all. Some of them as well, who could kind of sense sort of the latent, uh, not full-on racism, but prejudices I had. I remember a black Marine named Pate. This guy was fuck, dude. He intimidated me. He was strong as hell, and he was tough as nails, man. And he didn't like me to begin with, and now he had an even bigger reason not to like me. So I was dealing with the reality of, of you know, really having no friends and in a dangerous place, and my boss hates me with a passion. And so I had to buckle up and do the best I could. Then we were sent off to the Gulf War. 
<laughs> so now I'm realizing, fucking hey, man, I have volunteered to join the Marine Corps. I'm now in the Marines. My boss, who is literally my slave master, hates me with a passion, and I'm now going into a war zone in which he can order me to do virtually anything, and if it's a lawful order, in a time of war, according to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, I could literally be executed under the Uniform Code of Military Justice for violating a lawful order. That was my reality. And I can assure you, when you get put in a position like that, either it's going to break you and break you down and you're just going to wither away, or you're going to find some strength inside and do what needs to be done. And for me, it obviously, it worked out well, but it was extremely difficult at the time. And it was a horrible injustice from my perspective. And it was that injustice that connected me to injustice all around the world. And while my injustice was minor compared to what people are dealing with every day, for me, it was a shock. It was trauma. I was traumatized. I grew up around the idea of my nation being the greatest in the world. Freedom and democracy and honor and integrity and leadership by example it was all bullshit. Bullshit. And I knew it firsthand. And now I was in a position to kill or be killed in a war that, previous to the actual ground invasion and whatnot, you know, was looking like it could be really ugly. Really ugly. I mean, Saddam had, you know, 500,000 plus troops. He had chemical weapons, which, of course, we gave to him, so we knew damn well he had them. And, wow, you start to really search within yourself when you get put in a situation like this. And I reached a point in the Marine Corps where I said, well, fuck it. I don't give a shit. Whatever. Do whatever you want. They took away my rank. I was an E3. I was a Lance Corporal. I went back down to private, first level. They took away money from me. They took away my rank. They put me in jail. And I reached a point where, okay, yep, whatever. I don't give a fuck. You do whatever you want. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. And I could go into more details as to how I, I got out of the Marine Corps, but I can say in all honesty that I carried myself with honor. My enemies will say that I you know, did drugs or I did this, that, or the other. That's bullshit. I did some steroids. You know, that was commonplace in the Marine Corps. I did it a few times. That's what they ended up getting me for. Technically, the charge was illegal use of narcotics. Whatever. You know, fuck, they still encourage the use of steroids. That's great, man. Get them all pumped up in aggro and then they can die of cancer so we don't have to pay them any fucking uh, you know, benefits later on. It's perfect. And uh, when I came out of the Marine Corps, it's still the happiest day of my life, to be honest. When I got out of the Marine Corps and I drove out that gate for the last time, I swore I would never give up my freedom again and that I would exercise my freedom to the hilt. But the most important thing that happened in that experience was that the trauma had dislodged the years and years of conditioning which is inherent in whatever society we grow up, but certainly in American society, you're indoctrinated. You believe things that are completely rubbish. Nobody in their right mind would believe any of that shit if they were truly thinking for themselves, but everybody believes it. So it must be true. And I realized that what I thought was true was bullshit. So if the Marine Corps is bullshit, what else is bullshit? I was willing and ready to receive that information, whereas previously there's no way I would have received it. No way. If someone had told me, for instance, on 9-11, if I hadn't been through that experience and someone said, no, the U.S. government did it, fuck you, you know, I, I would have been just like any other idiot patriot who would have just, would not have heard it. I would not have heard it. But because of that trauma, I now realized, well, that's not true. Maybe other things aren't true as well. It was the greatest gift of my life. The greatest gift of my life. It helped give me a strength. It helped me become, eventually, I believe I'm getting there, a man, you know? I, I'm still not even completely there as far as I'm concerned. There's still things that I need to do to really be the man that I respect. But it helped me on my way. It, it helped push me in the right direction. And when I came out of the Marine Corps, I started a course of independent study. 
And I started to read books that they won't give you in universities generally. Some of the books I read, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Wow, wow, what a beautiful man. What a beautiful man. Love that man. Love him dearly. And what Malcolm taught me was, when I was a kid, they shipped us uh, rich white kids off to the poor black neighborhood once a week. They called it integration. And of course, as I told you, you know, I used to get into scraps, so they sent us uh, rich white kids uh, to the poor black neighborhood. And invariably, I would get into a tangle with some black kid, whatever, and I didn't feel what he was doing was correct, so all right, let's go. And so I'd get into a fight with one black kid, and next thing I know, I'm fighting three or four. And I'm saying to myself, fuck you, you know? Well, you, f you know, well, well, come on, one to one. Why, are you, why do you need three, four of you? And because of that, which is a really uh, predictable consequence of what was being done there, I started to develop real prejudices towards black people. I had a black friend from a young age. I mean, I wasn't an out-and-out -out racist. I didn't think every black person was this way, but I was developing a strong prejudice towards black people as a result of this. And I even flirted with some white supremacist groups when I was uh, in my later teens. And I nearly, I was that close, that close. I could, you know, and you can imagine, I mean, you know, if I knew a lot of their arguments, I mean, if I had joined any of these groups, I could have been one of their greatest speakers, recruiters, man. I could have brought in a lot of people, potentially. I could have been a real asset. And I, I was that close. And I love these facts because it makes me humble myself. The only reason why I didn't take that path was, I don't know, fate, the twist of fate, you know, things that I never could have contemplated. But I could have gone that way. So when I see a racist or a neo-Nazi or something like that, I see myself. I see myself that close to going that way. I understand how someone can go that way. I don't look down on people, I see myself. I believe this is very important. No matter how fucking wise and honorable you think you are, you know, we all make mistakes, sometimes really big ones. And we should forgive each other these mistakes, quite frankly. And if you look at the way we're being manipulated, it's quite easy to understand how these mistakes can occur. When I first got introduced to Malcolm X, it was the movie, actually. Who's seen Malcolm X, the movie? Amazing, amazing performance. To play Malcolm X, I mean, massive credit to Denzel Washington. That is not an easy role to play, and boy, oh boy, did he do it well. I read the autobiography of Mac Malcolm X, and I realized, oh my God. If I had been born black in America, holy shit. I would probably not be someone Whitey would want to know. And if you wanted to spout off to me, motherfucker, you know, you call me nigger? You fucking want to look at me like a nigger? Seriously, we got a problem. And I realized, you know, the rage that black people feel because I put myself for the first time in that position and I knew how I would feel. And I started to develop a real respect for the horrendous, experience that black people continue to go through. Just because they're reporting these stories of black people being executed now does not mean it's some recent wave. This is normal. This shit's going on all the time. And the only people in America that seem to be divorced of this understanding are fucking white people who are just a little bit too comfortable, quite frankly. Because if you get pulled over in America, you could be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, but if you get pulled over in a nice car in America as a black man, you're a fucking nigger in the eyes of many cops, and they have guns. And I've nearly been shot dead by a cop, more than once. God, the universe, whatever, shined down on me. I haven't, and it didn't happen, but that's as a white tattooed guy, not as a black man with an attitude. A black man with an attitude ain't gonna last long in America. And how many black people are in prison who are completely innocent, who were men who stood up and said, fuck you and did the right thing? Who knows? There's no way to know that figure. Malcolm taught me something that I was oblivious to before. I read the book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Has anybody read that book? Incredibly powerful book. It, it details the genocidal 
policies of America towards the Native Americans and the lies. It's not even an honest kind of genocide where you're fucking dead and we're going to kill you. Oh, okay, no, we, we want to we wanna make an agreement with you now. We're going we're gonna to give you this land and, you know, we're, we're going to... And then just fucking lied. Lied over and over. This, this history, this pattern, I'm telling you, is in the DNA of many of dark-skinned people. It's in their DNA. It's in their collective memory. And it's not the kind of thing that just goes away because all of a sudden you start acting half decently. It's still fucking there. And until we're honest, genuinely honest about this, it's still going to be there. How can someone heal when that individual, that entity which has been violating you in the most obscene of ways has never even had the decency to apologize? Iraq. Gee, what was the fucking main issue after we invaded that country and fucking devastated the whole thing? The economy. We're all fucking worried about the economy. What the fuck? We just killed a million plus people. We created millions of orphans, millions of fucking refugees, and we're concerned about the economy? We're not even fucking bothered to apologize for what we've done? What the fuck are we thinking? Are we serious? And why aren't we holding our fucking politicians to account? If I was Iraqi, if I was born and raised Palestinian, I'm honored to be a Palestinian citizen. I'm an, as close as you get to being a naturalized Palestinian citizen. And boy, oh boy, am I proud of that. But I have not been born with the skin color of a Palestinian in Palestine and lived that life as a Palestinian has. If I had been born in Palestine and had to endure that kind of injustice with my loved ones being threatened or killed or fucking tortured, I can assure you I would be involved in violent resistance without a fucking doubt. No way would I sit by and allow that shit to happen. No way. So I think we have a lot of nerve pointing a finger at people and calling them terrorists when they're enduring a circumstance which most of us could never even comprehend. We couldn't even comprehend. Can you imagine your child being ripped from you, being blown to bits? Can you imagine? Because I can, and I know how I would feel. We have a lot of fucking nerve talking about terrorism. We are the fucking terrorists. We pay for that shit. I read another book called A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Anybody read that one? Absolutely beautiful book. You could learn more about American history reading that one damn book than you could for fucking years and years of Harvard University degree fucking history course. In fact, you'll just end up being stupid if you go to a fucking Harvard history course, quite frankly. Which leads me to the point that really is quite funny. Who are the stupidest people on the planet? If we were to surmise, who's the stupidest people on the planet? Could it be the impoverished people of sub-Saharan Africa, or maybe the deeply impoverished, illiterate people of South America, or any number of places around the world? Well, we don't have a total monopoly on it, but boy, oh boy, we've got some incredibly stupid people there, that's for sure. But I'll tell you what, the dumbest of the dumb happen to have diplomas and degrees from places like Oxford and Harvard and Stanford and all the other vaunted fucking universities that we have. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why they're so stupid. Because the person who's got the university degree, and I don't mean to insult those of you who are university degreed, although I probably am, I don't mean to be attacking you personally, and presumably, if you're here, you haven't been so indoctrinated that you've lost the capacity to think for yourself. But believe me, that is the whole intention. You go to university, you jump through that fucking hoop and that hoop, and you do that back flip, and then you do your front flip, and then you do some more jump, jumping through hoops. And once you do that for enough years, and you prove that you can, like a dog on command, do tricks, then they give you a stamp of approval in the form of a diploma. And with that diploma, then you can go to some big corporation who will say, yes, we'd like to hire you. You have been vetted. 
And, and then you get this job and you make nice money. And you got a nice home, you got a nice car, your family's taken care of, all is well. The rest of the world may be sucking on it, but hey, things are okay over here. And uh, yeah, so I want to talk to this person. And we say, uh, hey, how about 9-11? What do you think about it? Oh, wow, yeah, that's just incredible. Boy, those terrorists, they're still coming after us, boy. Whew, got to take care of that. Yeah, but have you heard the, the, the notion that maybe the government was, oh, that's crazy, isn't it? That's just crazy. How crazy is that? And I'll tell you why these university degreed people are like this. It's because they've got the material rewards of their jumping through hoops and backflips to lose. They've got a lot at stake. Not very good for your political career nor your financial career. Uh, if you start talking to your colleagues at uh, J.P. Morgan uh, about 9-11, uh, who runs J.P. Morgan? <laughs> well, turns out they're the same bastards who were fucking directly responsible, actually. The same group, the same loyalty that those at J.P. Morgan and all the other big financial institutions and the big government and da 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 are directly connected to those who are responsible. It's not good for your career. Ask Niels Herrett. Not very good for your career now, is it? How many people have spoken out like Niels Herrett who were qualified? If you were to take a, a poll of how many engineers, structural engineers and whatnot that were qualified to speak honestly about this, how many have fucking spoken out? Are they all stupid? Well, I would argue that I know deep down subconsciously they know what's going on, but they remain willfully ignorant because that is much more favorable to their career. They are the dumbest people on the planet or they're the most servile and compromised people on the planet. And the way they suck you into that trap is the material. Once you're addicted to the material, they got you. They got you. Whether it's your material, physical life, or the material possessions you accumulate. And how do I know this very well? Because I got an excellent education in materialism because I grew up in Southern California, which is the epitome of materialism and superficiality. And I never felt really connected to the place. In fact, I could give a shit. I have no connection to that place. I had a great time, don't get me wrong. It's not like I didn't, I had a great time. You know, as a young man, I, you know, had lovely ladies that were in my life. You know, I wasn't socially awkward. I, you know, I was, I had fun, but I have no connection to the place. None. The values reflected in the people there do not reflect my values at all. So leaving that place is no sacrifice to me at all. So, these are the types of books I read. And I remember very, very well when I decided that I would renounce my US citizenship. And it took many years, actually, before I did it. But I took a course. It was in that period where I was open to information, new information. I wanted to know. And I took a course, American history from a black perspective. And I was very fortunate to have what I consider to be a good professor. Can't remember his name, but I think he was a good man. I very much enjoyed that course. And, and the depth of injustice and hypocrisy and everything hit home so much for me at that time. This was probably about 1993, 94. It hit me so hard that I remember in the classroom one day, it, 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 it went past the point of acceptability. It was beyond anything I could accept. And I said to myself, I will renounce my US citizenship because I am ashamed. Not only the crimes, I mean the crimes I could possibly deal with, possibly, if we at least owned up to it. Own up to it and fucking apologize. Carrying on this facade of freedom and democracy and you know, bullshit like that, uh, that I can't take. That I cannot take. So eventually, I did renounce. But first I went to Hawaii. I went to Hawaii uh, actually to escape a broken heart. My, my, my wife broke my heart. And I needed some place to run and cry and fucking be alone. And I had a friend in Hawaii, so I went to Hawaii. I became a dive instructor because I loved the sea. I knew I needed to make some money, so fuck it, let's do something that I love. 
I joined the Marine Corps. In that time, I also got a lot of these tattoos. I could sit here and give you a lecture about the tattoos, but they all have meaning. And they're something deep to me. They're commitments. You know, I can't reverse the fact, you know, these tattoos, I, can never, I could never get a job with IBM or some corporation. I knew when I marked myself this way, that's it. Now I'm as close to being a nigger as a white man can be. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and the white Irish know that very well. We were the white niggers of Europe, quite frankly. That's the way we were treated. And um, so, excuse me. So, I, um, I went to Hawaii, and I became a dive instructor, and I went to go get a job. Virtually every job I'd ever applied for, I always got. But with all the tattoos and whatnot, all of a sudden I couldn't get a job. So that was great too, and that was part of the reason why I got the tattoos. I knew by looking this way that opportunities would melt away and it would force me to take my own path. I couldn't take the easy route anymore. No longer am I this respectable white middle class guy who looks the part, talks the part. I was obviously some ex-convict drug dealer or some shit. I mean, look at him, he must be. And I knew that. I knew it would force me, and it did. So I had to start my own business because I couldn't get the job I wanted. And I did. I started my own business. And that business only died last year, 17 years later. My mom carried on the business after I left. And that business was the best dive business on that island and arguably the best in the entire state of Hawaii. That business led to the rescuing of about 55, 56 green sea turtles that were entangled in fishing line. That business led to the removal of about 13 ghost nets, some at 200 foot plus deep water. Uh, that business resulted in the creation of a marine sanctuary in our own backyard. And the reason why that happened is because my love, my desire, my ability, my the strength, the discipline that I had acquired over this period of hardship and whatnot was such that it combined with something even more powerful, which was attributable to one thing and an angle that I bet none of you would have thought I'd go into. One of the decisions that I made uh, in this period of growth was to become a vegetarian. And whenever I hear people say, oh, I could never give up meat, nah, bullshit. I loved it as much as anybody. In fact, it was not a meal unless it had meat in it. What, what's that? And I made friends with a guy who was a vegetarian. He was a great guy. I really, really loved him. And um, I talked to him about it. I asked him questions, and his answers made sense. And I, I was confronted with the reality, keeping in mind that now my mind is open to this, whereas before, no way would I have listened to any of the vegetarian babble, you know, but my mind was open, and I realized either you accept your own hypocrisy, i.e. you say you like animals and whatnot, and you fucking eat them, i.e. you torture them, you pay for their torture and their killing, and yet you say you like them. What a bunch of bollocks. Don't fucking say that. Just accept the fact that, well, yeah, animals are cool, but I like to eat them. I don't give a fuck if they're tortured. I didn't like that. It didn't sit well with me. You know, I, I want to be consistent with what I say is my values. I wouldn't want somebody torturing and killing me. Why the fuck am I doing it to someone else? And why is it that we arbitrarily consider human beings to be so fucking worthy while as the rest of fucking creation, the rest of life, which is just as sentient as us, the bond between a fucking cow and its fucking baby is just as strong as the bond between a mother of human form to her baby. And how arrogant for you to think otherwise. You rip a calf away from its mother, trust me. This is torture. I didn't want to deal with that hypocrisy. I don't respect the man that does that, so I took what was something that I loved. I loved meat. I enjoyed it as much as anybody. Something that I truly enjoyed and loved, I gave it up. I gave it up and never looked back 25 years later. No fucking way. Never going back unless I need to to survive. In which case, I'll fucking eat meat in a heartbeat. No problem. But until such time, I will not do that. That decision had such a profound impact on my life, I cannot tell you. The implications of making a decision which runs completely contrary to your own self-interest 
something that you enjoy so seriously, and you give that up because you acknowledge the fact that it is inconsistent with a moral, ethical existence. And I don't care what anybody says, I'll be happy to debate anybody on the subject, I will shame you if you want to use any of the normal arguments to defend this insanity. This is the one area where I'm actually pessimistic and I'm hoping that we grow a little bit more. While we're starting to become aware of human suffering and the punishment and the meted out nastiness that we are indulging in through our tax monies and whatnot, we are still remaining largely oblivious to the Holocaust times a thousand that is happening every single day without hardly a whisper. Billions, literally billions of creatures, if we count fish, chickens, cows, pigs, goats, and everything else, billions a day are being exterminated, life taken away, most of them tortured in one form or another, and how much are we talking about that? How much are we debating that? We don't even talk about it. Are we really serious? And I'll tell you what, if the principle that we apply towards others were applied towards us, let us imagine some species from another part of the galaxy or the universe that is more technologically advanced than us and by their own measurement thinks we are far more important than them, obviously, because if they were more important than us, they would be able to do to us what we can do to them. Clearly, might makes right. If we can take over their planet, if we can enslave them, if we can rear them for food, and if they taste good and we like to eat them, what the fuck is the problem with doing that? Clearly God said that we are capable and worthy of that, otherwise we wouldn't have the ability to do it. And so we do that to every other species, quite frankly, and if it were done to us, boy oh boy would we understand the wrong fucking path that that is. We would see it crystal clear just like that, but apparently we can't see it because we like the fucking taste and we're used to it. When we get serious, we will talk about this issue. We will talk about it seriously, but right now we're still not doing that. I am mostly optimistic, so I'll get more into the optimistic side of it in the next part. As far as I know, I think this is the break, so we'll leave it for there. I'm gonna grab another beer and then we can carry on. So anyway, I think we've covered sort of, you know, where I'm coming from and the world today. If there's nothing else over the last, uh, I mean, I'd say that I started to come into awareness and recapturing my ability to think for myself. And, and that, that's the first thing they strip you of. You school, fuck, that's indoctrination. And that, that's the first thing they strip you of. They reward you for regurgitating trivial pursuit questions. They punish you for critical thought. There's so many examples of that. So in, in the 90s, I started to recapture my ability to think for myself, which is amazing how much clarity comes from that, because believe me, I, I, I'm not being you know overly modest or anything. I'm not the smartest guy at all, you know? I mean, you know, fairly clever, but <laughs> I'm not. I'm really not, you know. Uh, it takes me a while to retain knowledge. I, you know, I'm, I, I, I have to work at it. And you don't need to be really smart at all. You just need to be able to think for yourself. Fuck all the stuff you've heard. Just think for yourself. A perfect example of that would be what I consider to be one of the greatest gifts humanity has ever been offered, and that would be 9-11. And I mean that in all seriousness. Not to dismiss the suffering that occurred on that day, people uh, literally being incinerated, turned to dust, whatever. And certainly, the mayhem that has come as a result of that. As I said earlier, I mean, I think the best estimates with Iraq is probably closer to two million dead. Well, maybe it's a million, or maybe it's 500,000. Does it really matter? It's obscene. 
whatever the number is. It is obscene. I've been, by the way, to Iraq. I mean, when I did the Human Shield action to Iraq in 2000, uh, 2003, early 2003, before the invasion, we went down to Iraq. And I could, I could definitely give a whole lecture about that. I could write a book about that experience. Uh, the short story is, you know, what I did was something really pure, really good, really powerful. It really resonated, but it was infiltrated. And boy, oh boy, if you're involved in direct action, boy, you need to be aware of how infiltration works. Uh, <laughs> Uh, especially if you have no capital and you need to deal with volunteers. Boy, oh, that's how they fucking get you. The volunteers will come and they'll be all nice and helpful and they'll have nice positive relations with all your you know, other people and they'll establish their relationships and before you know it, they start planting those seeds and they start sabotaging you on many different levels and this is how it works and it's extremely effective. The enemy on the outside is not nearly as dangerous as the enemy next to you who pretends to be your friend. This is part of the reason why I value honest people and integrity so much. It's a precious commodity that is all too rare in this world. And people who have integrity are priceless. You know, I've been down to Iraq, as I said, and, and um, I went to uh, Basra, in uh, southern Iraq, and they have a children's hospital down there. And in that children's hospital, at least back in 2003, they have photo albums, you know, photo albums that are about that thick, perhaps. And they have several of these photo albums, and I've looked through these photo albums, and the pictures they have in these photo albums are of babies born in the hospital back in 2001. Keep in mind, this is before the most recent invasion. And if you haven't done any research into Fallujah <laughs> or other places in Iraq, oh my God, they are advising women not to have babies in Fallujah. And for good reason. That ain't no paranoia. That's a fucking damn good reason. Because some of these babies, if they're born alive, or whether they're stillborn, many of them don't even look human. Uh, that is not a human baby. And you can imagine the trauma of not only uh, a man who fathers that, but can you imagine the woman who carries this thing in their womb for, for all these months, and then it comes out, and it, it, it doesn't even look like a human? It looks like some sort of fucking alien? I mean, wh what does that do to your head? <laughs> That's happened so many times. And I went to that children's hospital and I looked at those photo albums. And Jesus, man, there ain't no way we can atone for that shit. Uh, I mean, even apologies and, you know, f financial compensation, there's nothing we can do to compensate for that. <laughs> I've been to Palestine as well, I've lived in, in Gaza. I've lived in the West Bank. I was in Gaza for six months back in uh, 2011. One of my good friends was murdered down there. Does anybody know Vittorio Arioni, Italian activist? Yeah. He was a dear friend of mine, a uh, really close friend of mine. Um, we were on the uh, Free Gaza mission. Does anybody remember that, the Free Gaza, the first one? I was on that mission as well. I've, I've since been lied about and attacked by one or two of the leaders of that mission, and I'll name her because of the, the level of obscenity and lies that this woman has said, I've reached a point where I will name her, uh, is Greta Ber Berlin. And I'm not going to dismiss the good things that she's been involved in, even organizing this. You know, she's done some good things. She will not pay me this respect. You know, she will you listen to her say, I'm just the fucking devil incarnate. Uh, but we did something amazing with the Free Gaza mission. We, we made it to Gaza. We were the first ship in 40-something 40, 40 years, 41, 40, something like that. Since 1967, we were the first ship that made it into Gaza. The Israelis said that they would not allow us through, that we were no better than pirates. How fucking ironic is that? And we did make it. 
And that was actually when we got there, I mean, that, that was a moment you can't imagine. You, you cannot imagine. When we sailed into Gaza, the first boats that had sailed into Gaza for 40 plus years, there was thousands and thousands of Palestinians. They were all over the harbor. There would have been more, except most of them thought there's no fucking chance they're going to make it. So, you know, they, they just didn't waste their time. But for those who did make it down to the harbor, they were all over the harbor. Little kids were coming out and families and people were coming out on boats. Every boat that was available was coming out to us and people were jumping in the water. We came in the harbor. There were kids all over the place. I was driving. I was captaining one of those boats into the harbor. And my main concern was, Jesus, man, I had to like, you know, go forward, reverse, and I've got kids swimming around the back, the propeller, and all this kind of stuff. But it was amazing, mind-blowing, a euphoria that you can hardly imagine to do something so noble that actually succeeds in a world full of disappointments and heartache and so on. To be on those boats and to sail into Gaza and to have these Palestinians who were so used to being abandoned and just betrayed for a moment there was a glimmer of hope and a feeling that, yes, there are people out there who care about us. I, I, I cannot express. What is that worth? I don't know. How do you put a value on it? It's something that uh, most people will never know. That was where I requested Palestinian citizenship, by the way, and then they ended up giving us all passports. The Israelis stole that passport, but that's another story. You know, so many of the things that I've done would have seemed crazy. And in fact, you know, those who cared about me, genuinely cared about me, would have all advised me not to do it. I renounced my U.S. citizenship. And after this, I think I'll start to get into the current events and where we're going. But I renounced my U.S. citizenship after so many years in 2001, before 9-11. And you know, the reason was very simple. How many people have really taken the time to look at what it is to be a citizen? What does that mean, to be a citizen? Okay, a few of you have really looked at that. So if you've looked at that, and for those of you who haven't looked at that, that is a contract, effectively, legally, legally, different from lawful, legally, that is a contract. It's a contract that you were entered into at birth. Obviously, you had no say in the matter. And the contract is determined by, geographically, where you were born. So I was born in America, and I was entered into a contract of citizenship with America. And when I came to realize that my nation was not representing itself in an honorable way, and in fact was committing grave harm and injury to people all around the planet, all the while lying about caring about people and all this kind of shit, I realized I cannot remain party to a contract in which I am obligated under this contract to pay taxes. What's used with those taxes? How are those taxes used? What do we do with those taxes? Let me put it another way. If you want to kill somebody and you don't have the balls and the integrity to just fucking do it yourself and you pay someone else to kill someone for you, and even if you don't do it willfully, but you do undeniably pay someone else to go kill and this is not debatable. Is there anybody in this room who'd like to deny that? We, uh, there's one technicality. I'll see if anybody's clever enough to get it, because if you want to try and catch me, you will try this technicality, but I have a response for that as well. Do we or do we not pay for the murder of innocent people based on a pack of lies through our taxes? We do. So. Are we in a good position of integrity when we bitch and moan and complain about the policies when in fact the end result of our policies is literally torture, imprisonment, and death, dismemberment for little children, women, and innocent men for that matter who were only doing what I would do because if somebody was invading my country, I'll tell you what, I'll kill every last son of a bitch who was trying to do that or you're going to have to kill me. 
Because I couldn't live with myself to sit by and watch that happen and bow for my own life. I'll die, thank you very much. This is what we do. We pay for it. That's our consent, and it's even beyond consent. Now, this is less of an issue here in Denmark. I'll grant you that. Well, I'm, I'm being, I believe it's fair and objective, but you have your own responsibility. So I agree with everyone who's trying to object to what I'm saying. But the bottom line is, you know, Denmark is fully a part of the same system. Your financial investment would be a little bit less in terms of, you know, the overall amount of fucking death and destruction that comes from your tax dollars as compared to American or British tax dollars and pounds. But the bottom line is we are responsible. If we refuse to pay because we're afraid that we'll lose our freedom or our life or, you know, whatever, well, we've made a decision. We're willing to pay for murder because we're too afraid of the sacrifice we'll have to make by doing the right thing. That's not a very comfortable truth. And I think this is one of the real objects of, of these types of events. I could just preach to the choir and say all sorts of things that you would clap and cheer. I could sit here and say things about America. I could rant about America as good as anybody. And I can assure you there'd be more clapping in the audience. But is that really a service to you or to this world? It's not the comfortable truths that are, are the most important ones. It's the uncomfortable ones that are the most critical. So if I have irritated you or really kind of pissed you off fucking good because what I'm talking about is important and we need to face these things. And if we're really serious, we will face these things. And if we really do care, if we really have reached that point of humanity within ourselves, then we will make a change. Yeah. Let me qualify that just a bit though. Some of you invariably must be in positions on the inside of the power structure and whatnot, and I'm not necessarily saying that you should just sacrifice that, just throw it all away and go, you know, off the grid and just, you know, no, no. But in that position that you're in, there will be opportunities. There's one gentleman here somewhere. He worked in the banking industry. He's ne there you go. This man has been on the inside. He knows from the inside. He's going to give a lecture soon. And there's 25 times more people going to your lecture or wanting to go to your lecture than are here right now. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That man is inside and he understands the head of the snake as good as anybody. Just like I understand the military and the Marine Corps and war and so on, because I've been in that environment. I know it. So if you're inside, I'm not suggesting that you, in order to be a, you know, an honorable human being, you must sacrifice it all right now. No. Think about where you are. Think about what you know. Try your best to develop the strength to make that sacrifice when and where it will be most effective. Trust me, there are a lot of people in this world who are in the same position as you, and it's eating at them. It's eating at them. They're benefiting from something which is causing grave harm and injury to innocent people and it's hurting. You will never liberate yourself. You will never find any real reward staying within that system and doing what is more comfortable. You'll never know what I know. You'll never know it. Here's another thing, another philosophy that is really powerful. <laughs> I'm not a religious person, but I am a spiritually aware person. I reckon the reason why I have such strong empathy is that I have for some time began to reconnect with past experience. I never really relate to people who say I've been this person and I've you know, met that historical figure and I've done this and, I've, and they know all the specifics. I don't deny that it's possible, but I'm a little bit wary of that. At least from my perspective, it's not that clear. I just know that I don't need to come home and see my child blown to bits from a bomb to know how horrifying that would be. I reckon I have experienced something like that probably many times over, and I wouldn't want that for anyone. I would not want that for anyone. My God, if that happened to my child, holy shit. 
I don't know if I could cope with that. And that's part of what is amazing and inspiring to me with regard to the Palestinian people because so many of them have experienced just that and other equally horrifying realities. And I swear to God, they've not lost their dignity. Some of them, yes, they've been caught up in the hatred and the rage for what they've experienced, very understandably so. But a remarkable amount of Palestinians have not become the monster which is oppressing them. That is amazing. Amazing. Really. If you can get down into their world and that experience, that is remarkable. I've been inspired to no end. But not just by the Palestinian people, the Hawaiian people. Which may seem a radically ridiculous comparison, but I'm telling you, the Palestinian people and the Hawaiian people have something really remarkable in common. While the experience of the Palestinians is much more blatantly violent, the experience of the Hawaiians is no less heartbreaking. The Hawaiian people lived in paradise. You know, they, I've lived there, man, oh man, this is what you imagine paradise to be. It is mind-blowing, awe-inspiring. They had it. By the accepted version of history, they had it for about 1,700 years to themselves. The first Hawaiians who arrived there, apparently, and you know, there will be some who dispute this, the exact date is not important, but the bottom line is the Kanaka Maoli, the Hawaiians, the Polynesians who first found Hawaii did so roughly 2,000 years ago in the, in the time of Christ. When people say, if you could go back in time, where would you go? That's where I'd go. I'd be on that Polynesian canoe that was sailing the middle of the biggest ocean on the face of the planet when 1,500 years later, Europeans were afraid of sailing off the edge of the earth, which, wow, we're back to the flat earth thing. Back to the future, eh? When Europeans were deathly afraid of even leaving the coastline and sailing off the earth, 1,500 years later, the Polynesians were sailing the open ocean of the Pacific and navigating amongst these islands in the biggest ocean in the world. And here's another example of the ridiculous arrogance of us. Fucking Columbus. <laughs> Are you fucking serious, man? He didn't discover shit. All of it was discovered by dark-skinned people who we've never acknowledged, and that's just the reality. The Hawaiian people, many of them, from first contact, 1776, to about 100 years later, 90% 90%, I might be a little off on that figure, I should remember it, but it's right around 90%, was wiped out. This was a much more diplomatic form of genocide, however. We didn't just mow them down with weapons, we just brought disease. We just brought disease, and to say that we didn't know that we were bringing disease was, that's bullshit too. We knew damn well it was every bit as effective, in fact, more so. And 90% of the population wiped out we nearly exterminated the Hawaiian people. And those who survived, and more accurately, they're known as the Kanaka Maoli. Those that didn't die from disease, many died from what has been characterized, and I believe accurately so, as a broken heart. The love for the land and the sea that they came from, this beautiful blessing that they had been provided, was ripped right out from under them. And before it was ripped out from under them, they knew Colonialism was coming, and they formed the first nation outside of the Western world that was a sovereign, recognized nation. This is a story that very few people know. And I believe it's a very important story because Hawaii is used as a military outpost. It has every branch of the U.S. military. Pacific Command is there. Pacific Command, in its own mind, has jurisdiction over the largest swath of the planet. Literally, the United States, the Empire, through Pacific Command, considers a massive area that ex it goes through all of the Pacific Ocean, into Asia, into uh, Australasia, and New Zealand, and South America, and Central America, and to the West Coast, and so on and so forth. It's used 
as an outpost for an empire which has proven its complete lack of morality and very aggressive, violent policies. It has been turned into the exact opposite of what it is. And the Hawaiians who had this beautiful blessing for all this time have watched it all stolen from them. And many have died from a broken heart. They really couldn't handle it. I admire that connection to the land and to the sea. I don't have that. I was born in California. I don't give a fuck about California. You know, I, I'm envious to some degree of the Palestinians and, and the Hawaiians and other people around the world who feel that real connection to the land and to the sea. And I've had to adopt places because the land I come from is all fucking stolen land anyway based on a fucking genocide which has never even been owned up to. How can I feel a connection to a place like that? I don't care how comfortable it is. So anyway, out of duty to my Hawaiian brothers and sisters as well, I say take the time perhaps to listen to their story. I did make a, a, a documentary way back in 2001 called The United States of Hypocrisy. It's a big part of the reason why I literally had to flee the United States or else I would have ended up in prison for some shit I never did. Just put some drugs or some explosives in my house and that would have been the end of me. Done. Fortunately, I do have a brain that functions and I did the best I could to protect myself and so I sought political asylum in Holland and there you go. That's a whole other big story. But we'll get into the current events as I see it. I see a lot of cynicism amongst people. I think I understand where that comes from. If you were to, let, let, let's take a poll here. If you consider yourself, let's say realistically on both sides, all right, if, if, if you're gonna be honest, don't, delusional optimism or pessimism, please just discount yourself, just purge yourself of the poll. Do you consider yourself realistically optimistic? Please put your hand up. Okay. If you consider yourself realistically pessimistic, put your hand up, please. Okay, it's fairly close. If I were to guess, I'd say the optimism is a little bit greater than the, the pessimism. Well, I think even that is probably a, a, a positive development, to be honest. Here's why I'm optimistic, but realistically so. If you want to maintain tyrannical control over a, a mass of people, I was talking about this uh, earlier with a young sister, and there she is over there. Um, there's a couple things that you're going to need to maintain if you want, if you're a tiny minority, I mean, and we're not even talking about 1%, it's not 1%. Put a few zeros in front of that one, and that's, that's who's running the world. Um, if you want to maintain control over the masses, there's a couple things that you're going to need to keep in place, because if you don't, you're not going to maintain that position. One of them is control and access to information. Information is power. That's, 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 a, that's something that, that is said and most people would acknowledge, but if you really, really get down to it, it is very profound. Information is power, big time, big time. Historically, we've not had it. Unless you come from, you know, the higher fucking classes, the kings and the queens and, you know, all the rulers throughout the ages and whatnot, trust me, you did not have access to the information. There is an entire history that as smart as many of us are in this room, we don't fucking know, man, because that stuff is still hidden. But we have access to information that previously was not even remotely obtainable. We have that now. We don't have any excuses now. You could have made an excuse back in the early 90s and the 80s and whatnot, but to make an excuse now is pathetic, quite frankly. Go fucking onto Google and punch in a fucking key phrase on any subject, and if you have even an ounce of fucking critical thought capability, you can make very sensible, logical, intelligent, wise conclusions. To say otherwise is bullshit, scapegoating, pathetic. You can understand. So 
Some will say that the powers that be, you know, the internet's all part of the program, it's all part of, you know, the whole design, it's going to be used, they're going to crash that along with everything else, and da 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 and I'm willing to accept that argument. I'm willing to accept that possibility. The internet is all one part of it. However, where I might disagree, or well, I will disagree with you, is that that's a fucking mistake. You made a mistake, a tactical error. Really. You have, as a consequence of allowing even a limited yet ex a significant amount of access to information to infect many people within society, myself included. And once you infect people with what it is to be human, as my good friend Vittorio would have said, stay human, I would argue with him about get back your humanity. So if he were still around, I'd argue with him about that. But nonetheless, we are not acting in a humane way. We are conditioned, much like chickens put into a cage, six strong to a little fucking area. You know what chickens do when you do that to them, oftentimes? They cannibalize each other. Tell me when you see a chicken cannibalizing another chicken in an environment, a natural environment, where food and access to all the things that are required, where does this chicken do that? A chicken never fucking does that. But stick them in a cage, and they'll do that. That's what we are. We're chickens in a cage. And we're doing a bunch of shit we'd never do if we had any kind of sanity and real ability to live and be human. So we are insane. We are in a collective state of insanity, literally. But the access to information has caused this spurt of growth, which is unparalleled, unparalleled. And I can tell you it is painful to sit by and watch the willful ignorance of humanity when 9-11 happened, and of course I didn't know all the answers, I still don't know all the answers, but I knew enough to know that everything that was being said was pretty much bound to be the opposite of the truth. And anyone who was buying that the United States would be seriously fighting terrorism, and what? We're going to invade and occupy a nation because it has weapons of mass destruction and may use those weapons, which we happen to provide in the first place, how did anybody in their right mind buy into that bullshit unless you are completely fucking programmed? You are not thinking for yourself if you bought that shit. Now, that was just... 12 years ago. Think about it. 12 years ago. That's not even a blink of an eye in terms of human history. Seriously, it's nothing. Nothing. And yet, today, let's find someone who says, wow, we had to do that, boy. He had weapons of mass destruction and shit, man, that was a real threat to us. And boy, in 45 minutes, he could have been hitting Britain and all. Tell me one person who would say that shit. Yet, a large percentage of the population bought that crap. It was always a ridiculous fucking argument. And we insult our own intelligence by having ever entertained the idea. And the idea that the United States, the fucking terrorist, ultimate fucking terrorist, which, hey, shit, let's go back to Vietnam. 20 million bombs dropped on that country. More than all of World War II combined. Agent Orange, millions of gallons. There are still Vietnamese suffering from the genetic damage of that shit to this day. And we're leading a war against terror? Never mind the Mujahideen and our support for Al-Qaeda. We are Al-Qaeda. Just as much as we're ISIS. We are ISIS. We are fucking ISIS. We through the approval of our proxies, are ISIS. Saudi Arabia, this monstrosity of medieval fake Islam, is our fucking best friend and ally. The last fucking military arms deal between the United States and Saudi Arabia was for 60 billion fucking dollars. 60 billion dollars worth of arms which they are using right now for many months to slaughter 
the poorest fucking people in the poorest nation in the Middle East. And it's not even talked about now. At least the Palestinians got themselves on the map. For decades, nobody fucking did anything for them. At least, and you know what it took to get our attention? Suicide bombing. That was where we were all forced to fucking, uh, and of course the system used that to say, look at the Palestinians. Look how fucking violent they are. They just hate the Jews. They just want to drive them all to see bullshit. They fucking did what any desperate person would do eventually. And I'll tell you what, if it happened to the American people, if they were occupied and treated like that for that many decades, holy shit. Holy fucking shit. We would have been blood in the streets everywhere. We would have been killing our own people. You collaborating? Oh my God. The Palestinians have been subjected to this and carried themselves with as much dignity as anyone could be expected to do. And the suicide bombings were merely a symptom of a horrendous fucking policy that we all sat by and watched. And shame on the fucking so-called Muslims and Arabs in the neighboring countries who turned their back on the Palestinians and continue to do that to this day. We have, as our best friends and allies in the Middle East, two primary nations, Saudi fucking Arabia. Oh, we care about women, don't we? Yeah, oh yeah, we, oh, those poor Afghani women. Oh boy, my heart fucking bleeds for them. Oh boy, it breaks my heart. The Saudi women, well, uh, you know, I mean, you know, so they can't drive and they can't vote and they can't go out in public on their own and, you know. Yeah, but, you know, I, I don't know, you know, it's fuck, it's okay, you know, it's not so bad. We care about women. And uh, Israel. So we've got a Saudi, medieval, Salafi, Wahhabi fucking monstrosity as our best friends and allies. And then we've got Israel. Apartheid is a very kind word to use for that. It's well beyond that. This nation has been, from the very beginning, <laughs> committing a policy of genocide. The, the legal definition of the word, according to Black's Law Dictionary, which according to law in the Western world, at, at least in England and America, this is the legal dictionary. What is genocide, according to the legal definition of the word? To destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, or religious group. That's the definition. To destroy in whole or part a national, ethnic, or religious group. Is there anybody here who thinks that Israel is not meeting that definition of the word genocide in what it's doing to Palestine? It is committing genocide. And who's their best friend and ally? and Europe, and Europe as well. What have we done to stop that? Have we done as much as we're capable of doing? No, the, the answer is self-evident. May I ask you a huge favor? <laughs> could I get one more if I'm gonna, I need to drink something if it's not, I could take the water but I'd love another beer if someone wouldn't mind getting me one. So let's get into the optimistic side of it, yeah? Did, w did, you, did you read my mind? Are you serious? <laughs> that's the hundred monkey. That, that's, that's us communicating beyond uh, the literal physical part of it, boy. Thank you, my brother. Let's get optimistic and yet realistic. I think one of the most amazing examples of reason, a reason to be optimistic, happened two years ago. There are more examples, for sure. In fact, I see them all the time. Keep in mind that, you know, when, when, even though we're not watching the mainstream news, most of us, I watch the mainstream news because, fuck, it's a great way to know what the agenda is. So, I mean, you know, that's, it's valuable in that regard. 
Anybody who thinks they're seriously watching the news to understand what's going on, I mean, is, is partially brain dead for sure. <laughs> so the news is nothing but negative shit. I mean, for the most part, it's all negative shit. And, and that would explain the cynicism, you know. I mean, if you're being pumped full of negative shit, then, you know, you're probably not going to be very positive. But if you are a little bit more of an astute observer and actually looking at what problems we face and what potential solutions we have, there are solutions for everything. Energy, for instance. You know, we fight these wars for oil and stuff. Well, fuck, we haven't needed oil since at least Tesla. And really, it goes beyond that. Why are we addicted to petroleum? Because it's a means of control. That's all. We don't have, and you know, this, this canard, this false bullshit about, oh, well, solar and uh, wind and all that. Well, fuck, we don't even need that. We've got free energy waiting for us. And that was proven by Tesla long ago and many others. We have solutions to our problems, but they bombard us <laughs> with one fucking tragedy and injustice after another. So we become cynical. But when you begin to take a, an honest look at what's happening in the world, you'll see solutions. And let me give you an example of what I consider to be a profoundly powerful example of what kind of power we have. If you recall a couple years ago, right about this time, we were hearing an awful lot about the red line. The red line. Chemical weapons. If Bashar al-Assad uses chemical weapons, boy, that's the red line. We got to go in. Because we got to help those Syrian people because, boy, oh boy, do we love the Syrian people. <laughs> oh, we care about them so much like the Afghani women. Oh, boy, we love them. Oh, we're so hard. Oh, my, my heart breaks. So, you know, Jesus, man, we have to help these people. You know, what are we, barbarians? We're not going to help these people? And if he uses chemical weapons, boy, we have to do something. It was so pathetically obvious, but only because the awareness of false flags was there. Go back to 2001, when a blatant false flag was done. From the first moment, it was ridiculous. And if we're, to be honest, in this room, how many people on 9-11 thought this is clearly not what we're being told, it is some form of false flag? I think if people are being honest, okay, it's a minority, that's, that, that, that's got to be somewhat honest here. I'm going to think that some of you may be raising your hand and not being telling, telling the truth, but nonetheless, I apologize if I'm falsely accusing you. The bottom line is most people did not think that our own governments would be involved in that. And to, let me be clear about this. Governments are just a bunch of pawns, a bunch of prostitutes. The, you know, it's not like George Bush engineered this. That was one of the most ridiculous initial. You think George Bush, in, fuck. Do you think George Bush does anything? Do you think he truly makes any decisions? Do you seriously think that George Bush is sitting there at a fucking table in the Oval Office and contemplating policy and dictating policy? Are you fucking serious? He's a puppet. They're all puppets. The, uh, the last president that wasn't a puppet was John F. Kennedy. Which I have to say on that note, uh, it is one thing that I, I feel a real love, you know, that at least we had one president. You know, we can get into arguments about some of the others that people vaunt and think are great and whatnot. I believe really, quite frankly, I mean, there were some others. You have to go back quite a bit, but wow, that man, he must have known he was a dead man. He had to have known. He wasn't a stupid man. Anyway, so... They were doing all this same bullshit two years ago. The red line, and you know, if he uses chemical weapons, then you know, we don't have a choice. We have to go in then. And because people have become aware between 2001 and 2013, that's 12 years, right? 12 years. 
really, that's not a lot of time. But the, the, the understanding from 2001 to 2013 was so profound that people in 2013 were like, this is bullshit. This is bullshit. You know, all the polls, this is polls by the system itself confirm this. They have no reason to lie about more people not approving of escalating the violence in Syria. Why would they lie and exaggerate the no camp, no, we don't want it? Why? There is no reason why they would do that. So, I mean, even the statistics we have from the system itself says that, from what I recall, 9% of the American public supported an attack, an escalation in Syria. 9%. When you consider the amount of resources and propaganda and lies that were being used that were almost identical to Iraq just 10 years earlier, look at the difference. Look at it. Look at it, seriously. Massive, massive. This goes back to access to information access to information. Just by knowing what a false flag is and how it's used to manipulate people, just the knowledge of that one fact is powerful. Never mind all the other things we have access to. And here's what happened. And, and be clear about this. This is what happened. They were doing it, man. They were doing it. They were doing all the things they do to escalate it then. And the UK Parliament, Cameron got up there, oh, we have to go. So they were going to you know, vote on it. The US Congress, the US Congress is the most servile, disgusting, bend over, take it up the fucking ass, bunch of traitors on the planet. Disgusting. And even the US Congress could not vote on it. You know why they never even voted on it? Because if they voted on it and did what their masters would have liked to do in direct opposition of virtually everyone who has even one brain cell within their brain, that would have necessitated an action which I can assure you would not be favorable to the powers that be. And while they foster revolution, revolution, boy, oh boy, are they using that one to fucking maximum effect. This is not exactly what you want for the program. You do not want an entire population of Americans, many of whom who are veterans who have fought in your bullshit wars, who happen to hold up a picture, which I liken to Tiananmen Square, or the Olympic athletes in, uh, I forget the year, who put their hand up, and 68. Iconic, iconic, seize the moment. And American soldiers took pictures of themselves with signs that said, I will not fight for Al-Qaeda in Syria. Pre-ISIS. If they simply followed the orders, I am absolutely convinced that the powers that be knew. If we just order them, we, we own them. Literally. Many of them are pedophiles. In the UK, you know, that's been talked about earlier. Let there be no mistake. I wouldn't want a prime minister who isn't a fucking pedophile, quite frankly. If I, was in, if I was a psychopath running the world, I only want a pedophile, and I want a videotape of him fucking a little boy or a little girl. I want it. And I will not fucking have somebody who's a prime minister unless I have that. And that may sound crazy, but I can assure you a very effective form of control. Very effective. And if you think that's not possible, open the mind, open the mind a little bit more. It's more than possible. The powers that be knew damn well that with no consent, none, and keep in mind, 
How big were the protests in 2013? Not very big, were they? Kind of like almost nothing kind of thing, right? There you go. What the fuck difference? A pro fucking day protest? Fuck. I hate that stuff. It's a social gathering. Quit bullshitting. We all get together. Oh boy, aren't we so conscious and humane and oh God, we're so good. Oh, we're great. Oh, we so care. Bullshit. It's a social gathering. Pat yourself on the fucking back. That's what it is. It doesn't make a difference. A day protest is bullshit. If you're going to protest, put your fucking body on the line. Do it for a week, a month. Block fucking gates. Block roads. Fucking do something real. Make your point. Don't fucking sit there on a social gathering for a month or, or excuse me, a day. And the bottom line is it didn't take protests, which I think tells you a lot. The only reason why they did not fucking go into Syria at that time is because there was zero consent. Oh. And there you have it. There you have it. They need our consent. They need our consent. Make no fucking mistake. And what I mean by consent is, if you have a day protest, and it happens to be a half a million or a million or even a couple million, yeah, yeah, great. We don't give a fuck about that. But if we know that you don't buy it, Mm, that's a bit of a problem. Because if we just tell our puppets to do what we want them to do, and they do that, you might finally find some fucking balls and actually do something. No offense to the women, because many of the women have bigger balls than most men, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> that's the power we have. We have this power. And where does that come from, that power? It comes from awareness. You have to be aware, access to information. You have to be aware. If you're aware, well, can't fool someone who's not only aware, but let's take it another step further, and it's the path that I've walked for some time. If a bullet enters my head tomorrow, and I am no more on this mortal coil, don't you cry an extra fucking tear for me. I have lived a life that is so rich that most of you probably have no fucking idea how rich that life is. None. And I don't care how much money you have or whatever you got, you probably don't know a damn thing about what I've experienced. And the reason why I've experienced that is because I've also learned some truths. For me, my mantra is truth, justice, peace. Fuck peace in a world with no justice. Fuck that shit. I'd rather die. Thank you very much. Peace without justice is a peace not worth having. The process in this simplistic form to a better world is truth, first step. That's the phase we're in right now. That's the phase. More and more people are becoming aware of the truth. Once you understand the truth, once you understand the problem, if you don't understand the truth, you don't understand the problem. How the hell are you going to solve your problem when you don't even know what the fucking problem is? Bit silly, isn't it? You need to know what the problem is. Once you're aware of the truth, now you're in a position to effect a necessary prerequisite for peace, which is justice. Because somebody who is cowed in submission, who's not fighting back with violence, is not actually feeling any kind of reward for the peace that you offer. They're simply cowed in submission. But they will rise at some point. They will. We are in that phase right now. We don't need to protest. And in fact, if we're going to do anything, we really, really, really need to be creative. Don't come at them from the angles that they've analyzed from a million different places. They know our psychology. They know our indoctrinated tactics. It's all fucking tired and boring, and it doesn't threaten them at all. Come at them from angles which I couldn't tell you. Fuck, you're all creative beings, man. You've got ideas and perspectives that I couldn't possibly have. That's the power that we have. Be creative. Come at them from every angle. I have my role. And those who are more conservative or more diplomatic and whatnot, many of them would point the finger at me and say, no, he harms the cause. He does this, that, and the other. That's okay. I don't give a fuck about their gratification or anything like that. I do what I do because it is who I am. It is who I am. And what I do 
is help push out the boundary. Push out the boundary so that the more sensible people, the more diplomatic people can come in behind me whose position was radical and unacceptable before people like me, but I make it acceptable. I push it way the fuck out there. But that's my role. That is my role. That's who I am. And I tell you what, if there is something that is a blessing of all blessings, it is to know who you are. Who are you, really? Come to a place of understanding. You should be angry. My anger is based on love. I don't know how anybody who feels love could not feel anger. Would you feel angry if your child was blown to bits? Why? Because you love your child. Are you wrong for feeling rage? Why do you have to be somebody who lives through that experience and not feel the rage for those who are going through that? Especially when you pay for it. We have much more power than we'd like to take credit for. And that, I will end what I'm saying with this one message because it is key as far as I'm concerned. There is a saying, excuses are like assholes. Everyone's got one. <laughs> How fucking true that profane statement is. Excuses are pathetic. The truth of the matter is, that the only way that this world will change for the better is when we, on an individual level and a collective level, take responsibility for the world that we live in. If we are not responsible, understand the magnitude, the profound consequences of your belief that we, you personally, being whatever, liberal, you know, da -da -da, doing the right thing, or whatever it is that you do, that we are not responsible. If we, we, we people, we the taxpayers, we the citizens, if we are not responsible, if someone else, whoever it is, is responsible, what are the chances that we're gonna be able to change things if we are not responsible? Is it gonna change? Are the powers that be gonna change out of the goodness of their heart? Are they gonna see the light as it were? That ain't gonna happen. And we're going to take ourselves straight down the path of total self-destruction. And we're going to fucking dishonor ourselves in the worst way. Because as it stands right now, our children do not have a future. We, this generation right now, is sacrificing the future of all life on planet Earth, including our children. Wow. What a fucking amazing thing to do. I want no part of that generation and I'll be happy to fucking die tomorrow before I'm part of that shit. So I don't care what the odds, I don't care how fucking daunting it is. I know one last truth. I'm gonna add one more. If you understand the world, if you understand life the way I do, I've taken the time to look at that word death. Death, what does that mean, death? For an atheist, all we have is life and death, that's it. You're in life, you have life. When you're dead, that's it, there's nothing else. I don't agree with this and I could talk about it for some time, but I respect that that's your opinion. But when you're like me, you understand, while not being religious, but being spiritually aware, that actually, there really is no such thing. What do you mean by death? You mean end? End, end of it all, that's it, the experience, all of it, it's done, it's over. If you believe that, well, fuck, it's easy to control you, I can assure you. Because if I threaten your life and I have the power to do so, trust me, you're gonna fucking bow if you need to to protect that only thing that you have that is of value. But if you're like me, you know that while I fucking love this life, I'm so blessed in so many ways. I have people in my life, my children, my wife, family members, friends that I love deeply and I would much prefer to live a life and be with them, especially in a better world. How much would I love that? But it is not the be all end all. And I'm not concerned at all about where I'm going. And if I have an opportunity to meet my maker, if a bullet enters my head tomorrow, and that's it, no more time, no more speeches, no more fucking love, no more making love, no more sharing moments with my children and all that sort of shit. If that doesn't happen again and I get to go up 
to the pearly gates and meet my maker, I'll tell you what, I'm going to look God square in the eye and say, boy, <laughs> that's tough down there. <laughs> Do I have to do that again, or can I please go to some part of the universe where there is sanity? <laughs> I hope so. But I'm not afraid of death. There is no such thing. There is no such thing, and this precious thing that we have called life, I will have exercised it to the hilt. I have not chosen to forego my freedom, nor my liberty, nor my life, and I've chosen to exercise it in a way which I can assure you, if you take that path, if you do the right thing, substitute for me, get rid of that, the right thing. Oftentimes, the right thing, trust me, your friends will say, are you fucking nuts? Why are you doing that? Do the right thing. I promise you, even if you fucking die, you won't die. You won't die, you'll be human for a day or a moment. And the reward for that is greater than anything you can imagine. Nothing in the material world comes close to that. One moment of that is worth more than a lifetime of bowing. So I believe I've said everything that I meant to say tonight. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> Love and respect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I keep? <laughs> Thank you. So, I've given that, by the way, I said I would. We, we are going to do Q&A. <laughs> I'm giving part of that to Johan, uh, Judith, and also Mark, and Ole as well. I mean, really, all of the speakers today, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Really, I'm blessed for the experience. I've learned a lot, and I always love to be around people who express their humanity and basically say the things that you're not supposed to say if you're looking out for your own self-interest. So that part of that goes to Johan, though. I really was really inspired by what he was talking about. Great. So any questions? Yes. Great. So if you stand up and speak into the mic, please. I'll try to. Um, I'll just tell you that in Denmark, you have the possibility to not to pay a tax for war. You can ask for taking it off if you have the real, uh, if you have the right. Uh, what do you I, I, I the get the point. Tax, yeah, you, 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 you can opt yes. out of paying for military. Yes. You know, yeah, you have, beautiful, yeah. really beautiful, <laughs> really. And I, I mean all credit. Oh, okay. Well, if you, ha if you don't have it, make sure it happens. <laughs> okay. One down there. Yep. One second. I'll on my way. Yeah. First of all, I would like to say what a refreshing energy. And then uh, I would like to know what is the technicality that you also have uh, an answer for in terms of defending citizenship that you mentioned in the middle of, <coughs> in the middle of uh, your speak. You mentioned a technicality in terms of defending citizenship. And you, uh, do you remember? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, what, so what's the question? The uh, question is, what is the technicality that you also have an answer for in terms of defending citizenship? I'm sorry, I don't quite yeah, understand. You, you, said, you said you had a response to that too. Like, uh, oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, shit, I'm trying to remember the context. Uh, I did have the answer, I wasn't bullshitting, but I'm trying to remember the context. So. Is, uh, um, Carry out yourself. Right. Technically, technically, uh, technically, all we're doing is paying the uh, interest on the debt. Technically, we're not actually paying for the military adventurism. All we're doing is paying the interest on the debt. So, technically, we're not actually paying for the wars. We're merely paying to paying off the debt. That that would be the cleverest argument someone could make, and factually, it's true. So if someone wants to say, oh, we're not actually paying, you know, okay, whatever. You got me on a technicality, but it's still bullshit. <laughs> we are paying for it. We're paying for mass murder. Any more questions? Yep, I'll be right there. One sec. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you, what's your view on the military's, uh, what's it called, the militarization of the police? Mm. Mm. Good choice if I was in charge and a psychopath and drunk on my own power and doing anything and everything I could to cling to power, I'd say that makes very logical, makes sense. But again, I, I actually love all of this draconian shit that they're doing. I think it's great because the powers that be, what they want, I believe uh, it was either Mark or Johan who was talking about this, basically uh, they want absolute control total control. They want to be gods, basically. They want to be gods. And um, it was Johan who said this. And um, so in their uh, lust for godlike power, seeking absolute control, this is one of the mechanisms that they're using. They could have, in my opinion, the powers that be, could maintain 90, 95% control over virtually everything. If they only maintained a reasonably sized middle class, that's a buffer. If you, if you keep the middle class large enough to, to be comfortable and willfully ignorant, eh, they'll be the buffer between you and the poor people who are just not fucking happy with the whole thing at all. As long as you have a reasonably sized middle class, you could maintain that indefinitely, but that's not enough for them. And we see this over and over. Hawaii, same thing. They could have cut a deal with the Hawaiians long ago, and the Hawaiians would have accepted something, but not even an ounce of decency. Total control is what they want. So, <laughs> good. I'm glad you want that, because sitting here in this world where you have 90% control is sickening watching this. But if you want to keep forcing the issue, great. Mandatory vaccinations in California, excellent. Love it. Codex Elementarius, fucking great. Chemtrails, awesome. <laughs> fucking transhumanism, brilliant. Bring it on. All that shit, bring it on. Bring it on because it forces us to do something. The more obvious and blatant it gets, the more we have to do something. The, the more that it's just sort of, eh, it's there, but uh, it's not that bad. And, you know, the more we could go on in this fucking ridiculous state forever. So I love it. I think it's great. And I'm happy for the big show. Let's do it. Excellent. So based on that, do you think that Americans should vote for the Donald Trump in the upcoming election? <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the movie Idiocracy? <laughs> President Camacho, coming up. <laughs> Just love that movie. Team America, that's another good one. Love that one. Um, <laughs> he's the best option. I mean, that's the sad reality. I mean, in all honesty, I don't give a fuck what you think about him. He is the best option. Hillary Clinton? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Holy shit, man. Are you serious? I mean, Trump's George Bush looks like a fucking intellect of all fucking proportions compared to this psychopath whose criminal history is so undeniable it's not even funny so between jeb bush or hillary clinton or fucking donald trump donald trump is the best option so in answer to your question yeah i think he'll win if it's legit i don't know he's he's such a self-righteous egotistical fucking prick that you know I don't think he has near enough balls and integrity to really face up to what you know, he'd have to do to actually turn the country around for the better. You, know, you have sort of an opposite, similar but opposite, like Jeremy Corbyn. I've met Jeremy Corbyn. He actually supported some things that I was doing, trade not aid for Palestine. He actually, I have video of him supporting what I created. He's an honorable man. I mean, you know, he's got a history in, in the parliament and whatnot. That is, you know, fuck, man, you can't dispute it. I'm not a socialist. I don't like socialism. I don't like it. Because I have much more faith in humanity. I don't want a fucking government giving a handout to everyone. We need to level the playing field, and trust me, people can take care of themselves. As long as the playing field is not level, then, well, yeah, you need welfare. You need a fucking socialist state to give at least some level of humanity to people. But that is not the answer. A fucking big government that doles out a bunch of money to fucking people who cannot take care of themselves? What kind of existence is that? So, 
I think, yeah, I, I, if I were American and I was confined by the bullshit limited choices you have, I'd, vo I'd vote for him, quite frankly. I'm he not that person, but that's who I'd vote for. He seems like the most honest of the candidates. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he says that, you know, he, he, he's, he's a billionaire, so even though he's gone bankrupt several times, which is fucking great business. That's the way it works anyway. But, I mean, you know, he, 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 he's, he's, he, fuck, he's pathetic. I mean, come on. He's, he's such a pff, egotistical maniac. He's like an Alex Jones of fucking presidential candidates or something. And it doesn't mean that Alex Jones doesn't say things that are valuable, because he does. But, you know, so many of his conclusions are ridiculous, and, and I don't know why anybody would entertain it. But... Yeah, he's the best option, isn't he? <laughs> Bernie Sanders. <laughs> he's yeah. fucking Zionist. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 he's like the soft Zionist, you know. I mean, that's, that's what they have, like the Chomskys. And I've met Chomsky, by the way, you know, and I, I love him for all the things that he's said and done that helped me grow and understand. But his position on 9-11 and his position on Kennedy, you know, is ridiculous. He's a very smart man. There ain't no way in hell he believes what he's saying about that. He's obviously compromised. And these are the people that you need to be most wary of. You know, they, most of what they say is true. Fuck, it worked on me. And I, I still love Chomsky. I do. I, you know, I'm sorry for him that he's saying these things. I mean, either the fear of God or maybe he's a willing participant in this. I don't know. I mean, he struck me as a genuine man. But uh, Donald Trump is the best option. <laughs> according to the rig system we've got. Sorry, my actual question was, um, if you consider yourself a realistic optimist, um, how do you feel about the potential of uh, the automated soldier coming into play in the future and whether that maybe clears the board for the power that we hold as people? It's, it's a very serious, serious. I mean, uh, they, they, they have predictive programming, right? Mark was talking about this earlier. You know, look at the Terminator movies and things like this. I mean, it's predictive programming. They're preparing us for that stuff. So it's a very dangerous reality. You know, we, we have to be aware of this. I mean, having robots, I mean, we already have a form of that in drones. You know, it's, it's only, we're, actually, I'm sure they're using drones that aren't even controlled by humans. You know, from what we're allowed to know, that is the only way it works, but come on. I mean, there's, you know, the chemtrails, Fuck, they don't even need pilots for that. Uh, from what I understand, you know, they've got that shit going all over the place, killing people all over the place. They don't even need a pilot. They don't need someone on the ground. They can do that right now. It's a very dangerous thing. Very dangerous thing. And I, you know, I, I, I concede that there is no... I am not... I do not know which way this world is going to go. I'm more optimistic because I feel deep in my gut, my intuition that we as people have a very, very strong constitution and ability to do things that go way beyond what we are thinking right now. We have no idea of our own power. And I have faith that the vast majority of humans, even with all this conditioning, even the six chickens in a cage that are cannibalizing each other, even with all of that stuff, it's remarkable how decent and honorable people are. Palestine being a perfect example. I have met people who have been through hell and the way they carried themselves, the way they acted, their attitude and opinion towards their oppressor blows me away. I'm not capable of what these people do and I've been so inspired so many times I can't help but feel optimism at what we're capable of. It's that simple really. Hi, I'm, I'm Simon. I'm going back to the uh, Corbyn question, which we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, do you think the UK government, and, and by the UK government I mean the, the real government, not the puppet government, um, do you think they're going to kill him or control him? My concern about Jeremy is I think now is the time for warriors. <laughs> you need a warrior. You need somebody with balls of steel, and for a woman, you know, the equivalent. I don't th think Jeremy has that. I mean, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, but I have already seen, I've seen him uh, already sort of disavow people that he had supported, you know, uh, 
There's an organization, Dar Yassin, remember? Dar Yassin was the first slaughter in Palestine, which was meant to send the message to the rest of the Palestinians. Yeah, you can stay. <laughs> no problem. We're going to fucking kill your ass if you fucking stay. So that's up to you. Stay or go. But Dar Yassin, that was the message. And, and that's uh, remembered each year. And there's a man who is in, uh, you know, who was one of the organizers. And he's a Jew. Or at least he was born a Jew, recognized as a Jew, and, and he's a self-hating Jew, and he fucking questions, uh, he doesn't question, I mean, he recognizes the obvious with regard to the so-called Holocaust with copyright marks and whatnot, that it's fucking bullshit. And it doesn't mean many Jews weren't killed, of course they were. Many Jews were killed and tortured and so on and so forth. But the official version of that is beyond ridiculous. And of course, you're not meant to say that. And, um, you know, he used to attend these Darius Seen Remembers events on a yearly basis. And I've seen him basically disavow this man. Political expediency, whatever it is, but a man, a warrior, wouldn't do that. You don't do that. You stand by your principles. Even if I don't agree with this man, even if I find his conclusions incorrect, I support what he has done. I admire his commitment to this cause, which is very just. And that's what you say. A warrior would say that. That's not what Jeremy Corbyn has said. I understand why he's doing it. I just don't think that that's the kind of character that has the strength to confront the powers that be because they will kill you if you do not do what they tell you to do. So I think he'll be just like Syriza, you know, in, in Greece. You know, look at the platform. Fuck, they voted him into a, a platform of no austerity measures. They even held a referendum <laughs> after being voted into power. And look at that weak, good-looking, fucking, eh, fucking bullshit wanker and what he did. I'd like to think that Jeremy Corbyn wouldn't be that pathetic, but it wouldn't surprise me. I hope not. I, I have to say, love and respect to you, Jeremy. I hope you do the right thing. I mean, he did help me. It didn't help me succeed in the, in the agenda, but at the end of the day, he was an honorable man, and he's been an honorable man. I don't like socialism, so I totally disagree with him on all that shit, but... Nonetheless, uh, I wish him the best. I hope he has it, but I don't see the warrior spirit in him, and I believe the warrior spirit is really necessary right now. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have a question about uh, the situation in eastern Ukraine, in Donbass. Mm. What is your opinion about uh, the situation there? And uh, do you agree with uh, Mr. Vladimir Vladimirovich's uh, policy in, in Ukraine when it comes to Crimea? Uh, and the whole uh, very difficult situation in, around uh, the Ukraine. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, you know, to me, I think when, when you think for yourself, it's all pretty much self-evident. I mean, we can listen to Kerry and Newland and all these other prostitutes and all the bullshit they're saying, and if you take that seriously, um, I would question your ability to actually think for yourself big time. I mean, all of what they're saying is absolute bullshit. If we, if we, let's, let's put it this way. Let us say that provably, in the public realm, undeniably, that Russia had pumped billions into Mexico to stir the shit and to get a government in place that would favor Russian policy at the expense of American policy. I don't think it would have taken more than about five seconds for America to start bombing and basically, f you know, funding whatever fucking nutcases would have been fighting and so on and so forth. We look at what Russia has done, all the accusations, and, oh, it's all bullshit, isn't it? Where is the empirical evidence? And even if they were supplying the, those in eastern Ukraine with weapons, <laughs> what's wrong with that? It's their border. And these people want the help. They're asking for it. And clearly the government in, U in Kiev, <laughs> does anybody seriously think this is like a representative government that is looking out for the interests of the Ukrainian people as a whole? They're nothing but puppets, an oligarch in place, a pathetic, compromised, corrupt son of a bitch who's nothing more than a puppet. Bend the fuck over and take your orders. That's all it is, and it, it seems to me very self-evident. I don't know why anyone would take anything that's being said by the United States government or its fucking puppets seriously. But I love one thing about the Ukraine situation. <laughs> well, I think it's great. I, as I said, I love all this shit. Good, 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 good. Keep doing that. Excellent. 
is Europe, how long is Europe going to pay the price for this insane American policy? How long? <laughs> well, uh, you know, okay, if you're, <laughs> if you're willing to carry on paying the price for an insane American policy, which makes no <laughs> sense at all, okay, but I guess I have faith in uh, humanity, and that includes the people of Europe, because I just don't see how you're going to continue to fuck yourselves over for American policy. I don't see how that's going to continue. So it's good. Great. Keep it on. Go on. Excellent. Yes, uh, Ken, thank you so much for a very inspiring and awesome lecture so far. Um, I would like you uh, to, uh, to go into the awakening within the armed forces maybe of the world, but especially the U.S., where you come from. Mm. Uh, how do you see the role of that awakening, the warrior spirit, as you talk about? How important is that, and how can we help facilitate the awakening in the armed forces? Yeah, excellent question. You know, um, <laughs> that, that's another experience. In my personal experience, you know, when I... Especially when I did the Human Shield action to Iraq, I'd renounced my citizenship. It was on the back of 9-11. You know, most all of the American military and all that shit would have considered me just an out-and-out -out traitor, you know. And uh, boy, has that changed. Boy, has that changed. I'll give you an example. When I have gone back to Hawaii, which is mistaken for the United States, it's a stolen nation, indisputably, it's not America. It's a military fucking outpost. And so I don't, I've never intended to return to America. I, when I have gone back, I've gone to Hawaii. So I, I'm obligated to make that distinction. When I have gone back to Hawaii, uh, I went back, I think it was 2010 after the Mavi Marmara incident, and I went back another time. Two times I was uh, called by the FBI. The first time... I was called, uh, I, I received them, they said, yeah, they would like to talk to me. Okay, absolutely no problem, come on, you know, they knew my address, so they came to the address of my mom's house. And um, we sat down and we talked for, I think, at least two or three hours. I've never, you know, you got a question for me? The only question I will not answer is any question about my family and fuck off. You know, including my address, fuck off. You know the address anyway, fuck off, I'm not telling you that, you know. I'm not going to let low-level assholes fucking have access to my address who might be so fucked up that they want to use that information against my family. No fucking way. But, you know, you want to ask me about why I do what I do, who I've met, you know, and so on. I'm not going to give you names, but I will tell you flat out, yes, I've met people that you would deem to be terrorists. I've said that directly. Yes, I have. And I have every right to meet anyone I want to meet. Does that mean I agree with them? No. If I met with George Bush, would you imply that I agree with him? No. I don't fucking agree. I'd meet with him. A fucking bastard, but whatever, I'll meet with you. So the second time that I met with the FBI, this was really telling. I, what was this? It was like uh, 2000, maybe 11 or 12. And um, I came back. Keep in mind, I've got a dive business. At this point, that would have been a dive business that was in place for 12 years or so, 13 years, something like that. And a very special business at that. And some special people working there. And I have come back, you know, I've been gone for most of the time, but I come back every now and then. So I'm back now, Ken is back, infamous Ken. And, uh, and uh, you know, they get a call. <laughs> they get a call, the receptionist at Di Deep Ecology, my dive business, get a call from the FBI. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, we're calling for, uh, this is the FBI, I'm special agent so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, is Ken uh, available? Uh, no, I'm sorry, but uh, and they took a message. So, so here I've got these mostly like Californian influenced, you know, diving, they love the ocean kind of employees who care about ecology and so on, receiving a call from the FBI. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and so uh, they give me the information. I call the FBI agent. I call him up and, uh, and he says, oh, thank you for, for calling us back. I said, uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, what can I do for you? Uh, well, you know, um, it's, uh, we've had, I said, you know, w what is it? The Israelis saying I'm a terrorist again. <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, except they're now saying that you received money from Hamas. <laughs> and I remember immediately when he said this, I said, is that right? 
So how much are they saying that I received from Hamas? $400. <laughs> and I laughed like that. <laughs> I said, oh, I guess I'm a cheap son of a bitch, aren't I? 400 bucks. <laughs> and he laughed as well, and he said to me, you know, yeah, we know this is bullshit, and this, these words I'll never forget, and we don't like the Israelis. I'll tell you what, man, the attitude towards Israel has changed profoundly, and I'm part of that. You thought I was a traitor. I'm exposing how the enemy within has fucked your nation. And 22 Americans committing suicide a day is testament to the fact that fighting wars for Israel is not good for America. And that's what you're doing. So, you don't like me? You think I'm fucking anti-American? Well, what fucking ever. But he didn't think that way, and I can assure you he was a reflection of a lot more people. There are good people in America who aren't pedophiles, they're not criminals, they're good God-fearing Christians, no matter how much you may oppose whatever religion, they're good people. They have wives, they have children, and they are bothered in a way that they had never experienced previously. And I'm part of the process of helping them understand that. So I'm optimistic. I loved it. And I sat down and talked with him for two or three hours as well. And I tell you, we had heart-to-hearts. And I've had many such conversations. Every time I go into the United States, I am treated like a terror suspect. It is ridiculous. They literally follow me everywhere in the airport. They follow me into the fucking bathroom. I've walked into the bathroom and watched them come in. Are you fucking seriously going to follow me into the bathroom? You have just fucking looked through everything in my bags. You have inspected me more than once. And yes, they follow me into the bathroom. And then when I go to the gate, I have seen up to nine, nine fucking TSA fucking agents at the gate. After I went through a double, triple check at the fucking security area, and they're following me through the airport into the fucking bathroom, and then when I come out, there's nine of them fucking sitting there, and they don't just inspect me, they even have the fucking nerve and audacity to pretend as if when I get up, we're doing a random check. (laughs) Are you fucking serious? It's a joke. It's a bad B movie. Isn't Arnold Schwarzenegger, Bruce Willis, and fucking Sylvester Stallone gonna jump out any fucking moment and save the day? Great, so we we have one last question, I'm afraid. So just one last question. Uh, Hi, Um, very inspiring. So thanks. Um, and I have one question because there's one thing I've been pondering about for quite some time now. Um, I want to hear your view on the um, the fake alien invasion and the Project Blue Beam and all that crazy. What aspect? What aspect of it are you interested in me talking about? I want to hear if if you think like it's just a fear tactic or if it's like. Um, yeah, because also I, I was thinking about your like military uh, past, and maybe you had some intel from from people in the in the business or yeah, business. Um, so maybe maybe you knew something that some of the other speakers didn't know. I don't know. I just no. I'll wonder. disappoint you there. I'll disappoint you there. But uh, you know, I mean, in general, in general. <laughs> Whatever it is that that we're being manipulated to believe, of course, the same rule always applies, and it's a useful tool because part of why I th- I think I I have I resonate with a lot of people is that I've 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 been able to recognize the pattern. Once you recognize the pattern, this stuff is all so transparent; it becomes very easy, and you know. How can we keep up with every fucking new development? I mean, you know, it's too much. We, we, you know, we have jobs, we have bills, we have to take care of our families, you know, to keep up with, it's part of the cleverness of the whole thing. You know, you can't keep up with everything. Jade Helm, another example. Maybe it is the big move. So far, it doesn't appear to be. It seems like another psychological operation to me. Keeping you, I think Mark uh, may have said this earlier, but it's so true, 
Um, if it wasn't him, whoever it was, but I mean, you know, keeping us in a state of anxiety, a lower vibration, constantly concerned or afraid, that's very powerful in itself. Very, very powerful. And you know, what are we afraid of? I mean, you know, it's, a, it's kind of ironic, you know, the, the type of, of truth that sometimes is uttered from the mouths of prostitutes who pose as politicians, but, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said something very profound in we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Indeed. If you're operating on the basis of fear, fear of what they're going to do with this action or that action, <laughs> they've already achieved a very important strategic advantage over you. If, however, for instance, as I, I was talking about earlier, you know, if you're not afraid, I, I don't believe in death as people understand it. I mean, I'm, I'm not making this up. And believe me, I've contemplated, I have contemplated the, the worst realities. I mean, it's part of the mental preparation for dealing with the potential reality of, of what you do, the consequences of your actions. I have contemplated the murder, the torture, the abduction, the violation of my children. I have contemplated the murder, the violation, the abduction of my wife. I have contemplated the murder, abduction, torture of myself. All of these things are possible. And it's very easy to control somebody if they're afraid of that. If there's one thing, one thing that has given me pause over my life, it is that my actions affect the loved ones that I have in a way that was not their decision. That's not an easy one. That's not an easy one, and you can never feel good about that. And boy, oh boy, that is the ultimate card they can play because if you're not afraid to die yourself, if you're not afraid to be, you know, to lose your freedom, making a decision to endanger your family is a tough one. And in this respect, oh, my wife and my kids, oh, forgive me if anything comes to you, if harm comes to you, I, I can't change that because shit, man, that's where they can stop any progress. They, if they know they can't get you, they'll go for those that you love. And what can you do? I mean, if you bow to that, this will continue until we totally destroy ourselves. We have to do it. And, and let me say this. Don't you fucking clap for me because I'm so brave. I'll tell you what. There are people on this planet all over the world whose names you'll never know and historically who have done things way beyond any kind of bravery or anything I've ever exerted. I'm telling you, there are people in this world to this day and who have lived and their names and their numbers will never accurately be known, but I'm telling you, there's shitloads of them. And they stood up and they did the right thing knowing that the moment they made that move, they were dead. And probably their family would be killed and tortured and maybe even in front of them to send a message and they did it. So many people have done that, you can't imagine. And it's those people that I love and respect more than anyone else. And for them, and for the future of our children, I do the best I can in this insane world. But make no mistake about it, for all the cynics out there who wants to fucking dwell on the masses who are fucking stupid, entranced, and brainwashed, there are warriors, men and women, who have done amazing things who have stood up and faced death square in the face and did the right thing. Love to you. Love to you. That is a human being. So I don't give a fuck what their agenda is, and I don't give a fuck how cynical people are. There is too many human beings who have lived in a way that is so admirable and so courageous. I will not ignore them. I don't care how much everybody else does. I will not ignore them. Another big hand for Ken O'Keefe.